Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, just a, a word. I will be uh, putting up a PDF with the notes of all of these slides, so you don't actually need to take photos. You can if you want. And I'll also, you notice I've put a video camera there. Um, I'll be videoing both of the sessions, and they'll be up on my YouTube channel probably tomorrow or, or Thursday. So you can come back and have a look at them, see if there's anything interesting that you want to follow up. Um, there's one slide which isn't on this yet, which I only found the, the picture uh, over the weekend after I'd sent it here, and I haven't got a PC that was working easily. Um, but I'll add it into the PowerPoint. It's a very interesting chart about selecting blockchain, but more of that later. So leadership, gaining business value from advanced and novel technologies. And we know that we're in chasing all sorts of interesting new advanced technologies at the moment. Things like analytics, AI, machine learning, and of course the thing that everybody's looking at, uh, blockchain. So I'm going to be looking first of all very briefly at what I think leadership perhaps might be about. Is that the way that I've seen it operating in my life for the last five years, which has led me to be here rather than sticking uh, safely back at home in the university. Then I'm going to be looking a little bit about the analytics, AI, and machine learning side, and posing a few interesting questions that you might want to ask yourselves before you dive deep into the expense of something. And then I shall be having a little look at what is blockchain, what are its fundamentals, and therefore helping you to decide whether you even want to go near it and touch it. It works for some things, and it probably won't work for an awful lot of things. So these are some areas I'm going to be covering. These are the areas, the topics for today here. So, a little bit about leadership, and then I should move on to what does leadership need to do in relation to analytics, AI, and machine learning, and then what might you be wanting to think about as you th look at possibilities for blockchain in your organizations. And given that finance is really quite important in most companies and have a quite a significant say in what projects, IT-related projects, get launched, I want to pose some questions to you that really will help you to make some interesting uh, judgments, uh, help to lead your company in the right way to gain value from IT. Now, a couple of little slides about how different people get things done by their teams. There's the kind of managing sort of approach where you're kind of trying to get people to go in the right way. There's another chart I thought of over the weekend I perhaps ought to have as a side one, which is Gantt charts and resource profiles as well. So there's this sort of managing thing, getting things organized, getting things done, or there's the leader out there. And everybody, for some reason, follows them. Understands where the message is, where the strategy, the vision is going. And then fall in and actively support. And I want to have a look at this next slide about what are some of those critical things that good, inspiring leaders actually use. How do they make people want to follow? Well, the first thing is they need to have a very, very clear vision of where they want to go, what they want things to happen, how they want things to happen. But it's great having a vision, but if you communicate, communicate it in a monotone, no one is going to go to listen, they're going to fall asleep. But if they have a passion about it, they're really enthusiastic, they're going to get people following them. People want to follow people who are passionate about things. Moving across to the right-hand side, leaders are able to communicate. They understand what makes people tick. They understand how to make people engage with the message that they are giving out. Communication and passion kind of work together. But one of the things we know from watching seniors of the companies that we work for, we work in, is 
We know how cynical the workforce gets if they see this leader, the seniors, saying one thing about what you guys down there can do, or must do, but those rules don't apply. Walking the talk. Those things together are really important. But then, if you are going to set a new direction, you also need courage. Because change is uncertain, but you need the conviction of your beliefs, of your vision. So five things that traditional examples of effective leadership. And I think there's a couple more. Oh, there's one more thing about that I've that brought in just recently. One thing about leadership is that leaders probably do not tell people how to do things. They have a team that they have <coughs> trained, empowered with techniques and methods and things, so that you just have to say, I would like to do this, in this example, get across the river. And then you trust the team, you empower the team and trust the team to find the best, the right solution. You've taught them all of the important questions so they know whether they need to build a bridge or find a little boat or whatever, an answer that is suitable for the specific context. This comes out of military training uh, theories from long ago. But what is it that makes people inspiring? Is it uh, a really great leader? Is it just those five factors, or is it something else? Someone who is inspirational, who empowers their staff, their teams, and then trust them to learn from any mistakes, because we all make mistakes. You don't, if you're working for a great leader, you never need to ask permission. One of my ex-deans uh, made the point terribly clearly about three years ago. I came up to tell him what I'd already decided to do with a colleague, and he stopped me almost before I got started. He said, Richard, you're not asking for permission, are you? No, Nick, I said. I'm just letting you know what I think is best to do. Because, thank you. Because previously, other deans needed every last idea brought to them for permission. They were the micromanagers. <laughs> so, I think leadership is much more than those first five on that got orangey red. I think it's to do with inspiration, it's inspiring behaviour, it's empowerment and trust. Now, before I move on into the more kind of AI technology side, just one thing. What you're going to hear is going to be fairly deep levels of scepticism, of asking a lot of questions about some areas of technology which are becoming very prevalent in parts of business. And we can see already some very interesting things going on. And as we look at these technologies, they are incredibly powerful. And if they are used in the right circumstances, in the right way, they can actually make quite a big difference for good. But if we don't ask the right questions, if we aren't deeply skeptical and just take it on because, well, it's the hype. It's a thing that everybody else is doing. Do you remember 2007, 2008, and the lead up to that? Quite a lot of people were getting quite deeply nervous about all those CDOs and so on. But no chief exec dared get off the roundabout until the music stopped. They knew it was dangerous, or some of them did. And they stayed on because of peer pressure, because they knew that if they got off the, uh, this roundabout, which was generating staggering amounts of profit, they would lose their job. We need to be skeptical. It's not cynicism at all, it's skepticism. Cynicism is, I don't believe it and you can't prove it. Skepticism says, here are the questions, tell me the answers, convince me. 
Very briefly, we have GDPR going to hit us very, very shortly about the use of personal identifying information, personal information, about profiling people, making automated decisions about financial decisions, perhaps. There's all sorts of consequences. I'm sure you're bored to death with it. However, there is one aspect that will come out in the next few minutes, and that is the second, uh, first and second of the sub bullet points, the use of algorithms and transparency of, uh, yeah, the fact that we cannot explain what many of our predictive analytics models are doing. We cannot explain what machine learning is doing or why it makes its decisions. And that can be a problem and will be a problem under GDPR. So as we go into the business value aspects, here are the five, four topics. But I want to start right, right back. Some reports that started in 1994, called the Chaos Reports, by a group, an organization in um, the east coast of the USA called Standish Group. I don't know, has anybody see, heard of the Standish Group reports, anybody? They show a very interesting picture over the last eight, 17 years or so of the success or failure of IT-related projects across the world. About 50,000 reports from C CIOs every year, every year or two. The problematic set is the fact that the blue and the purple middle lines, the successful projects on time to budget delivering the signed for contracted functionality in the, third, the blue line, hovers around about the 30, 35% for almost all time. We solved to some extent the orange, red and orange ones, which are the failures that never get anywhere, never get implemented, and they're now running around about 20%. And then you've got the green and the top blue ones, which are the ones that kind of rumble on, they're over budget, they're late, and deliver only part of the functionality. Now, lots and lots of CIOs said, hey, but with the modern sort of technologies, and all the other things, it's not fair to say, did you deliver everything that was contracted for? Because the world changes, moves on. So we need to change stuff. So we don't deliver that, but we add a bit more. And they said, Standard Group, please, please, please change it to on time to budget, delivering business value, which is that line. Now, the CIOs all thought that by changing to from all the functionality to delivering business value would improve the success rate. And they back correlated it or evaluated for the previous two years back to 2011 and 12 and found that that delivering business value parameter rocked the boat badly. It dropped that success rate by about 10 points, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it was what was reported by the CIOs. We can now see that they're stabilized at about 30%. So all of those IT projects that you guys and your team and your, senior and your colleagues are authorizing, only 30% are delivering business value. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Now, it turns out that this sort of success rate is, around, is similar in all the AI machine learning <coughs> advanced analytics projects which are going on at the present time and back three or four years. So we need to start thinking a little bit carefully about our projects we're going to be doing in machine learning, AI, uh, for business, and perhaps blockchain if we start investigating where it might work. Now, <coughs> just to point out what that 30% of success rate really means in shareholder value, we spend three trillion dollars a year, roughly, on IT across the world. A report only two, a month ago suggested that because of the one hour a day that 70 or 80 percent of people use to move data from one system to another system, they're losing 10, that 10, 12 percent productivity. Average
average across the working population and factored by various things, it looks as though the fact that our IT systems don't integrate well, are not terribly effective, they don't do the job that the users actually need, is probably worth $6 trillion of wasted productivity per year. Add on security failures, the economic cost of breaches, at around about £400 per set of data breached, that's about another $400 billion. Challenge fail projects, probably another half billion. And the world GDP is only actually about $70 trillion. So we need to do something more interesting and better about all of our IT. We get data from everywhere. You guys are collecting data from all sorts of interesting places. But how much can we trust that data? How do we know whether it is accurate or, accurate or not? And I learned a very interesting lesson after I saw this picture from uh, John Easton from IBM. I saw about 2014. And I looked at that little bit at the bottom there and thought that's about 20% of its enterprise data in SAP and so on that we can trust. And then I thought, ah, but I helped implement SAP. We cleaned out 70% of all the master data um, before we went live. And then I discovered that a range of companies, five to eight years after they've gone live with a new ERP system, are having to do data cleansing exercises again to clean up the data that's got dirty in under eight years. Our IoT devices are amazingly inaccurate. That is a uh, GPS tracker sitting still for 24 hours, taking a reading every second. It was not stationed quite clearly. It was moving plus or minus about 25 meters. We can't trust definitely any data from IoT sources. We, have, we can get some estimate of how accurate it is, plus or minus 20, uh, 15 meters or so for that tracker. But every other device you have, measuring stuff on your uh, instrumentation and stuff, none of them are perfectly accurate. The per interesting point about this veracity problem is not to try, not, not that you mustn't do analytics, but you need to understand and therefore ask the questions, how accurate is my data? And how does that level of accuracy affect my business decision making? If you're using a GPS like that, 25 meters is neither here nor there if you're using location, trying to do location target adverts. It's when you get to the 15% which isn't that accurate and the 5% which is about 40 or 50 kilometers in error, that's a problem. You see, we then say, oh, I, analytics, all these lovely things we need to do, and then that happens. Do we understand what the data is, how accurate it is? Do we understand the biases in it that are naturally there? Because we've only got a 5% market sector share. The data we have is everything on those 5% of people. You machine learn it, and it knows exactly how to do what you did with that bit. Is that relevant? Is it going to help you with the other 95% that you're trying to get into? You've got biased data. Be careful. Think through the consequences. Not to say don't do it, it's just think through the consequences. And then we have to think about what the AI and machine learning does. And there's some stuff called clustering that a lot of data scientists love using to help you guys understand what's going on and make decisions. But it can easily do something like that and confuse cappuccinos and, uh, what was it, uh, cappuccinos and espressos. We know they're different. Do you know, does your data scientist know whether they're making similar mad uh, similarities in clustering stuff together. Maybe in customer clustering, your marketing. They may or they may not find out, challenge them. Machine learning, 
for image recognition. The top one they were trying to train, um, I think it was Tomahawks, to distinguish between friendly and enemy tanks. The system was trained perfect, up perfectly, did the testing perfectly, and accidentally they discovered that the system didn't know anything about tanks. It knew all about the backgrounds. It hadn't even noticed it. Or the bottom one. The biggest problem we have with face recognition today is that they're seriously racist. They cannot see black people, and they certainly can't see dark black female faces. The British police have just been using face recognition to, cap to identify people in the crowds going to football matches who are banned from football matches. And the false positive rate is currently running at 89 to 88 to 90%. So they're hardly, they're they, I mean, they find a few of the people who are banned, but they're stopping quite a lot of people who shouldn't have been stopped. They're very polite about it and say, terribly sorry, here's a link, you can go and find out what was going on. You see, what's happening is it's ever so quick to do a lot of this machine learning training. You get all of the data about your customers and the decisions you've made, shove it into the machine, and over a period of maybe a week or two weeks, it just depends, you get this beautiful machine learning decision-making system. But you cannot explain it at all. And under GDPR, if you're doing financial evaluations and profiling of people, you have to be able to explain to them, your clients have the right to ask you to get a human to do the decision and to vet it and to explain what the machine did. You cannot explain those sorts of things, or even regression analysis, which is using 50 or 100 parameters. If you've got one parameter, yeah, great. But if you want to be compliant with GDPR, if you want to be compliant with many of the financial regulations, you need to do that. The only problem is that to do that, a proper decision tree, which you can explain because you drop out there and there, it's going to cost you a year to do it properly. It's going to cost you a million dollars, perhaps, or euros, and it's a year compared with one or two weeks. And you cannot, under GDPR, end up there. So, lots and lots of questions that need to be asked about the use of this sort of, these sort of technologies. They can do some magically good things, some really great things. But, you have to ask the right questions. You have to get the right testing. And that one is part of the problem for that racist face recognition system, because 75% of all the faces in that database are white males. There's a tiny, tiny set of dark black women in it. There's a fairly small set of black men in it. So what? Bias data. Just got to quickly go through blockchain. These are some of the students who have actually helped me with the details for the next bit. I want to whiz through this. Basically, blockchain is a distributed ledger. You all know what a journal is, I guess. It's a core, well, a sort of a core, it's a record of all the transactions. And that's all the blockchain is, except it's just copies of it are spread all over the place. Um, and you have to remember, it is the journal. It is nothing else. It's not your accounting system. It's the journal. You wouldn't run your company off your journal, would you? It'd be a bit tricky. Why? Well, it's a political exercise by and large, or it started off as a politi political exercise to get rid of intermediaries like banks and all the other people who take the money off you and don't contribute. Except, if you have a credit card or a debit card, having Visa, MasterCard, Amex in the middle, or your bank with your bank cards is kind of helpful if you lose things. They can fix it. With blockchain, you forget your ID or your password, you've lost it. Let me just, you'll have to read through this, I'm afraid. Because so that's the fundamental picture. It's two accounts, a from account, a to account, and something in the middle, which might be a value, a smart contract, or something. And smart contracts are not very smart. They're about as complicated as Snakes was on your Nokia phone from 1995, 98. That's about all it can do. A few if then else's. 
but it can hold a lot of stuff, and there's all sorts of funny things going on. Lots of different applications are being looked at at the moment. Some of them are certainly going to be very, very good and very powerful. Some can solve some very interesting problems in third world countries about things like owning a house or property, provided you solve a few other problems related to holding that identity protected for a long time. All sorts of things going on in supply chain management that is, and identity management, but there are questions. Now the challenges are here. And the ones in the text are the ones that my students found for me over the last couple of months. And they are the questions, ultimately, that you have to think about. If you are going to have a system that holds your records for 50 to 100 years, you know, some of us are going to own a house for 50 or 60, 70 years. We have to remember, we have no software that has existed for 50 years yet. We have no file formats at all which have been unchanged over the last 50 years. Even the simplest file format, the .txt, has changed its format and its uh, standards a couple of times over the last 30 years. So we have to be thinking about longevity. <coughs> we have to be thinking about what happens when I lose my ID. If I have a house on the blockchain, owned on the blockchain, that's the only proof I have, and I lose my ID or my private key, I can never ever sell that house again. I can never prove my ownership of that house. And in supply chain, yes, once it's in the, in the blockchain, it's certain, but humans are stunningly inventive about finding ways around things, and the fraud will always exist outside the blockchain, not inside the blockchain. If you can find ways to solve the fraud outside the blockchain, you've probably found a way of solving fraud in the existing systems as well. And you won't have to invest in something new. So questions, questions, and yet more questions. The final one is selecting projects. You saw that chart from Standish Group, 30% success. Now I have a lot of experience about developing systems over the years. I think we develop too many systems too quickly. We should look at our system requests and then call out only 30% of all the projects we want to do and then invest enough money in those projects. And I think that, plus some of these other ideas here, might help us to get much more value out of our IT spend than anything we've done in the past. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Da har dere som har orange navnbrikker, dere skal ha møte ute i salen, og så kommer vi i neste gruppe som har...